As, as I'm sure Emily is for your dedication and continuing to show up for our talks. It's very gratifying. So thank you for that. Uh, today we want to talk about Islam. Obviously the dominant religion in this part of the world. And it's a religion that very few people in the West, in my experience, really know hardly anything about. And those who comment on it often say things that suggest that Islam is this solid single monolithic kind of belief system that all Muslims are together and trying to take over the world and that sort of thing which nothing could be further from the truth and we're going to talk about that a little bit today uh, there certainly are factions of Islam that are militant and aggressive and dangerous there have been factions of Christianity and even of Judaism likewise that have been very much like that in the past and in the same way that Christians or Jews don't want to be painted with the same brush of what small minorities have been, neither does the whole world of Islam want to be painted with that brush. We'll talk about that a little bit. What I want to do today, first let me stick up here for, and I promised I would do this at the start and end of each talk. Uh, this is the email address where the videos will be available. We'll be posting both my talks and Emily's. This is the website for our Institute of Theology in Mexico. When you, when you go to this web, uh, web address, You'll see the, the landing page, and there's a bar across there, and toward the right-hand side of that bar, it says Windstar Talks. You click on that and pull it down. There will be two subsets. One are, uh, one's called the Footsteps of Faith, which are the talks I did a year ago for Windstar, and the next, uh, the next thing below that will say Wonders of Arabia. That will be where you find the talks from uh, Emily, Emily and myself, okay? And also my, web, uh, my email address, if you have any uh, questions, any way I can be of assistance, if you'd like to contact me, please feel free. If you can't find the website or anything else I can do to be of assistance to you, all right? Again, uh, this is the introduction to Islam. I have one more talk I'm planning to do, which will be tomorrow morning, which is history, conflict, uh, culture and conflict in the Middle East, in which I'm going to sort of give you much more subjectively than on most of my talks, I'm going to give you my viewpoints as to why there is no peace in the Middle East. What the problems have been historically, why have we gotten to this place, why is it so hard for them to find a resolution to the conflict that occurs in this region? So we'll talk about that. Um, as I've already mentioned in a previous talk, Children of Abraham, Islam is one of the three great monotheistic religions that trace their roots back to Father Abraham. It is an Abrahamic religion, to use that expression. It is the third of the Abrahamic religions. And it, uh, Muhammad, the prophet who started Islam, saw or believed that God had given him a corrective to correct the distortions and the mistakes that had previously been made by Judaism and Christianity. We'll get into that a little bit when we talk about the relationships. Um, you looked at this chart as well, whereas Judaism and Christianity see themselves as descending from Abraham and his wife Sarah through Isaac. Isaac's son Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel, which were the sons of Jacob, and then uh, that's for Judaism, and then Christianity sees Jesus as a descendant of that same line through Jacob's son Judah. On the other hand, we have Abraham having had the son Ishmael through Hagar, um, the handmaiden of Sarah, led to the 12 tribes of Ishmael, the descent of which then eventually led to Muhammad. This is how they, all three of these religions see themselves as going back to Abraham. Now, the Prophet Muhammad, and my apologies to any Muslims that we have in the group because representing the image of Muhammad is considered completely inappropriate, but for the sake of education, we'll do that. Muhammad was born in 570 in the city of Mecca, which is why Mecca continues to be the holiest of all sites to Islam. His name, Muhammad, means highly praised. Muhammad was orphaned at age six. His father died before he was born. His mother died when he was six. He was raised by an uncle became a shepherd for his uncle and then started working on camel caravans, became a businessman who was apparently very well known for his honesty and his hard work. When he was 25 years old, he was employed by a woman, a widow who was wealthy named Khadija. Khadija and Muhammad apparently fell in love because they married when he was 25 and she was 40. She was 15 years older than him. They continued to be married for 24 years and contrary to the common practice in those days, um, Muhammad did not take any other wives during that time. Apparently they were very dedicated to one another. She became very supportive of him because in his late 30s, Muhammad started going into the mountains around um, Mecca, especially during the holy seasons, to pray and to meditate. 
after one of these events, when he was 40 years old, he came back down and told his wife Khadijah that either he was going insane or God had spoken to him through the angel Gabriel, known as Jabril in, in, in uh, Arabic. Khadijah encouraged him. She believed what he'd been told. And after several more visitations by this angel Jabril, um, Muhammad agreed that, yes, he was supposed to be a prophet. He was to carry a message of God. The prophet Jabril had said, proclaim, or recite in some translations, the things that he was to be told, and so he memorized these messages. He was illiterate. He did not write them down. They were written down later by his other followers. But um, Khadijah was his first convert, and the message in the simple form was that the, the people of Mecca, to begin with, and then others, were to stop their pagan polytheism, because even though Judaism and Christianity were both common in this area, and Muhammad had, had been introduced to both of these faiths because uh, working in the caravans, he traveled a great deal. There were a lot of Jewish people. In fact, later on when he moved north to Medina, there were five tribes of Medina. Three of them were Jewish. And so there was a lot of Judaism. There was a lot of Christianity. Um, and so the message to the people of Mecca was get rid of your polytheism, return to a monotheism, stop being so immoral because remember we're talking about ethical monotheism here because prior to the monotheistic faiths there really was not any mandate in religion necessarily to be ethical and yet Muhammad said the message was give away give up your immorality give up being evil give up your materialism and return to belief in the one true God so this was the message that he communicated this gives you a map um, which I've used a version of this before this is Mecca, where he was born. We'll talk in a few minutes about Medina, which was originally called Yathrib. Um, and this, of course, is the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. We came down this way through the Suez Canal. We visited Aqaba. We're right here, right now, I think. So gives you sort of the lay of the land. We are circling the uh, Arabia, where he was born and lived. Muhammad always insisted he was not an angel, because the there's a belief in angels in Islam. He was not um, a miracle worker. He was not divine in any way. He was simply a prophet sent to give a message. In the first three years of his preaching, he only had 40 converts. There were only 40 people who believed in his message in, in the first three years. But his message threatened the Meccan way of life because he was telling them, get rid of your multiple gods and change the way you live. He was messing with their morality, he was messing with their theology, he was messing, most importantly, with their economy. Because he was, he was telling them they had to change the whole way they were living as a society. He and his followers began to come under very heavy persecution. At first it was just mockery, and then later on, violence. They were stoned, they were beaten with sticks. Um, during the times of prayer, they would be covered with dirt, they were imprisoned, um, merchants refused to deal with the followers, uh, sell anything to the followers of, of Muhammad. After all of this time, there's actually a period in there, in fact, when it got so bad, he sent some of his followers across the Red Sea to Africa, and they stayed there um, in what was then a, a Christian kingdom, and then later returned. In 622, the people of Yathrib, which we know of as Medina, had heard about this man, Muhammad, and they sent a message to him and said, we're having a terrible problem. We understand you're a moral man and a good leader. We'd like for you to come and help straighten out our problems. And if you do, then we'll accept the religion that you're preaching. So in 622, they had the great migration north, which is called the Hajira. And because of this, it's and they, they barely got out because the Meccans found out that they were, they were leaving and they they weren't pleased about that, so they tried to stop them, but they did manage to get away. And in 622, that's where they marked the beginning of the Islamic faith. The, the Islamic calendar begins in the year 622 AD, by our reckoning. When Muhammad got to Yathrib, which later was renamed Medina al-Nabi. Uh, Medina, uh, Medina al-Nabi means the city of the prophet, and it became called just Medina, the city. When he got there, these five tribes who couldn't get along, he managed, he apparently was a good administrator. He put together a, a, a governing system that they all agreed to. He pulled the five tribes together, and it was considered such a political miracle, not as much a religious miracle as a political miracle, although they also accepted his faith, then people started coming from far away to, to see how he had done this, how this had happened. 
Well, that created even more problems for the Meccans because they didn't like it, and several times over the next several years, they attacked Medina. They mostly were defeated and fought off, and then in 620, uh, I'm sorry, 630, finally tired of the uh, periodic attacks from the Meccans, the Medinans, Muhammad and his followers, marched south, they defeated the people who were running uh, Mecca, they took it over, they got rid of all of the idols that were in the Kaaba, which is a temple, a black stone, uh, a temple that's covered in black fabric, and you've seen it, we'll look at it again in a few minutes. And then in 632, Muhammad dies. Now I'm gonna give you quite a bit of history here, because I think history, not only do I really like the history, but I think it's very important for you to be able to understand a lot of what goes on in Islam today, to, to have a perspective on some of that, is to understand where they're coming from, because some of the key historical events in um, the history of Islam are directly reflected in some of the things you hear about today. Now, during Muhammad's life, I'm gonna show this map several times, all of this area uh, along the Red Sea amounts to almost half of the um, Arabian Peninsula converted to the faith that he was preaching, as well as Oman. The people of Oman, the Islamic people of Oman, are very proud of the fact that they were some of the very earliest converts to Islam. Now, this was, the orange part is what it looked like about the time of Muhammad's death. We then enter into a period of what's called the caliphates. You know, this lists the, the various events I just talked about. 632, Muhammad dies, and a series of caliphs, which, which is the Arabic word for successor, come along. Um, the, the government under each of those caliphs are, is called a caliphate, and you will hear, if you've read any history, or you'll read about the caliph of Egypt or various other titles like that. Caliph means the successor to Muhammad. The first major caliphate after Muhammad was called the Rashidun Caliphate. Rashidun means rightly guided. There were four successors immediately after um, uh, Muhammad in the next 30 years. Those men were named Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. Now it's important to understand this because the biggest single political problem that Islam had occurred during this time. All four of these men were close followers. They were known as the companions, there were others as well, the companions, the close followers um, and, and disciples of Muhammad. But of these four, three of them were related to Muhammad by marriage. Two of them were father-in-laws. One of them was a double son-in-law, married to two of Muhammad's uh, daughters. But the fourth one, Ali, was the only one that was related to him by blood. He was his cousin and also his son-in-law. He was married to his daughter, Fatima. The problem was that when Muhammad died, there was a serious disagreement over who should be his successor. Many of the people felt that Ali, since he was the only blood relation, and also they believed that something Muhammad had said once, suggested that Muhammad wanted Ali to be his successor, there was a group of people who were called themselves the party of Ali, or the supporters of Ali. In Arabic, that's Shia. And they thought Ali should be the successor, but most of the companions did not think he was the best choice. And so instead, they decided the right thing, because Muhammad had not, they, they didn't think Muhammad had clearly identified a successor. They felt that they needed to find the one who would best represent what Muhammad had presented, be the best Muslim, in other words. And so they ended up electing Abu Bakr, one of the closest uh, to Muhammad, one of the oldest. He was his father-in-law, the father of either his third or fourth wife. We actually are kind of confused about what order, because after, after his marriage to uh, uh, Tajida, he, he married several more times. Um, so Abu Bakr is right here. Actually, that's this one. Abu Bakr was father-in-law, um, father of his either, either second or third wife, excuse me. Under Abu Bakr, the first thing that happened when Muhammad died was that a lot of the various tribes that had become Muslim, remember, they, they were told you have to be moral, you can't worship multiple gods, you have to pay, you know, you have to give money to uh, the cause of the needy. Well, some of them rebelled against that, and so we had the um, campaign on the apostasy. Abu Bakr was successful as the, success, as the first successor or caliph after Muhammad in pulling all those people back into the faith and cleaning all of that up. 
He then immediately launched a very aggressive military campaign to convert the surrounding areas, um, the rest of the Arabian Peninsula, and he began to move west into Egypt and north into other parts of the Levant. I'm going to show you a map in a minute. But this war, war of conquest that Abu Bakr began was the thing that first started expanding the geographic area that Islam uh, covered. The second, after Abu Bakr died, Abu Bakr left a will, and he said that the best successor to me is a man named Umar. And he, uh, Abu Bakr had seen the military and the political abilities of Umar, and he left a will saying, Umar is my successor. So once again, they passed over Ali, because he's still around. So Umar comes in, and Umar is um, the father of Muhammad's fourth wife. He furthers the conquest. Um, he was a good pick in that regard. He expanded the growth west into Egypt, north into the Byzantium, uh, in, in the Byzantine Christian areas, and into Persian Sassanid Empire. So they're beginning to expand uh, extensively at that point. Umar is also known for setting up the political structure that would represent the Islamic kingdoms after that. He established also the Islamic calendar. So each of these four Rashidun, or rightly guided caliphs, were responsible for some critically important aspect of what would become Islam. Now the interesting thing is that as Umar pursued this, he set up the government structure, he did not require that people convert to Islam. They were defeating the military, you know, taking over military control, but they did not require conversions. All they really required was that there be an Islamic governor over each of these regions, and an Islamic accountant, a financial guy, and that all of the people in these regions pay a tax. Well, they expected the same thing of Muslims, We'll talk about the zakat later, but everyone had to pay a tax back to Islam. Now, um, Umar was assassinated by a Persian um, servant in 644. Before he died, he nominated a six-man committee to decide who his successor was going to be. And this is uh, Uthman, the one they selected. Uthman was one of those six. Ali was one of the six, too. So for a third time, they passed over Ali whom some people, ought, at every case, everyone said he should be the guy that's in charge. Uthman comes in, he was the double son-in-law of Muhammad, married to two of Muhammad's uh, daughters. He is very popular for the first six years of his 12-year reign, probably the most popular of the Rashidun Caliphs. But later on, some of the people started, uh, especially some of the Egyptian Muslims at this point, started really making a fuss over the fact that Ali should be the Caliph. And they began to give him more and more trouble. And in fact, they began to get so aggressive, they actually were rebelling. But uh, Uthman did not want to suppress them by force because he did not believe that Muslims should fight against Muslims. Well, because he did not suppress them, they ended up assassinating him one morning while he was reading the Quran. Well, at his death, and, and by the way, while he was reading the Quran, his probably biggest contribution to Islam is he is the one that formalized and finalized the form of the Quran, which we'll talk about, the holy book. Finally, finally, Ali gets his chance. He is the fourth of the Rashidun, uh, or rightly guided caliphs. He comes on board. The first thing he does is he replaces several of the provincial governors who had been related to Uthman, his predecessor. That didn't go over very well, particularly because Uthman had been assassinated. A lot of the people uh, started being angry at Ali because they didn't think he was taking seriously enough the need to take revenge for Uthman's death. In fact, Aisha, one of Muhammad's widows, put together an army and marched up to Basra, captured 4,000 people that they thought had been responsible for the plot to kill Uthman, the previous caliph. They executed them, and then they marched toward Ali's headquarters, because Ali had moved the capital from Medina up into a city in Iraq. So though Ali goes out with his army, the two armies come together. Apparently the leaders didn't really want to fight a war, but they were making a show of force. But in the middle of the night, the two armies clashed. And we have what's called the Battle of the Camel. It is the first Muslim civil war. And in fact, it's one of the first examples we have where the Sunnis, who actually Ayesha represented the non-Ali party, which came to be called Sunnis, and the Shias, the party of Ali, fight one another. And so they have a war. Ali's um, forces win. He has Ayesha, his stepmother, 
uh, ex uh, sent back to Medina under guard, very politely. But because Ali was still being challenged and he kept trying to make peace, a lot of his followers were upset that he didn't just establish his authority, you know, stamp his foot as caliph and say, you're going to do it my way. And as a result, he ends up being assassinated. And when he is assassinated, a new uh, caliphate comes in. This is the end of the first four, the Rashidun Caliphate. And we have a group that is related to Uthman. Uthman had been of the, of the tribe of, of the Uyamids, and he takes power. Now, this is the extent of the, the Rashidun Caliphate. All of the Arabian Peninsula, most of Egypt, all the way over Libya, all the way to Tunisia, all of the Middle East, up through part of what we know of as Turkey, um, all of Iraq, Iran, over into Afghanistan, this in just 30 years after the death of Muhammad. This was, at the time, the largest empire that had ever existed. There have been bigger ones since then. After the Rashidun Caliphate, the Umayyad Caliphate comes along. I'm gonna move more quickly through these. There's not as much detail in them. The Umayyads come along, and um, they are responsible, they, they move the capital because the head of the Umayyad um, Caliph was the governor of Syria, related to one of the previous caliphs. He moves the capital to Damascus in Syria, which is why Damascus has always been a very important city in Islam. Um, during this time, they continue the expansion, they continue taking over um, other territories. The interesting thing about this is that Mu uh, Muawiyah, who was the, the first of the Umayyad caliphs, is married to a Christian. His wife is a Christian. And he is very, as most of the caliphs were, he is very patient with Christians. He does not require forced conversion. And I say this because a lot of people have this mistake that whenever the Muslims took over, they forced everybody to convert. That very seldom has been the case. Um, that Christians, like all other religious groups, were required to pay a tax. But other than that, they actually were allowed to govern themselves. And Muhammad actually said that, that other religions should be left alone to follow their own faith as long as they pay a tax and don't create problems. And so this was followed. There were, however, people who were opposing this caliphate, and so we end up with the second and third Muslim wars, but by the end of the Umayyad Caliphate, as they continued expanding, they take over all of North Africa, what's called the Maghreb, all the way up into the Iberian Peninsula. This is what we know of as Spain and Portugal. And they actually reached up into France. On the eastern side, still all of the Arabian Peninsula, all of Iraq, Iran, all the way up into part of Turkey, all the way over almost to India. Again, largest empire to date. So this map shows the yellow is the part that the four caliphs were, were uh, the Rashidun caliphs, the first ones after Muhammad. The green shows you all that was done by the Umayyads. And very particularly, you'll notice here, when they were in the Iberian Peninsula, they had military campaigns as far up into Europe as Tours in France, and all the way up to Constantinople, although they didn't succeed in taking over that property, okay? The, Umayya, the Umayyads are then thrown out of uh, office by the next caliphate, the Abbasids. And when the Abbasids come into power, they are particularly known for the education and the culture and the science. Tomorrow morning, uh, when I do the history, culture, and conflict, I'm gonna talk about the golden age of Islam. The Abbasids moved their capital to, to Baghdad. And we all saw the footage. You think of Baghdad as being kind of a dusty, dirty, you know, primitive looking town. In the golden age of Islam, under the Abbasid, Abbasids, the city of Baghdad was the most sophisticated city in the world. In fact, it was a time when they had science and culture, philosophy, invention, medicine. In fact, between the 9th century AD and the 16th century, there was no need for them to have any, for instance, there was no translation of any medical uh, books or information from the West because they didn't need it. They were so far advanced. They truly were way ahead of us. Um, I'll talk about it more tomorrow, but there's a reason we use the Arabic number system instead of the Roman numerals. 
and I'll give you a challenge. So now when you go after your cabin, you all know Roman numerals, you know how to do Roman numerals? Write down five Roman numerals of any size and try to add them up. <laughs> Seriously. Mathematics, simple arithmetic, was not possible until we adopted the Arabic number system. And when I say that there were no medical texts translated from Western languages into Arabic but until the 16th century, the reason is because syphilis came to the Islamic world from the West in the 16th century and they'd never seen it and didn't know how to treat it, so they translated a document to tell them how to, how to treat syphilis. Beyond that, there was nothing to be learned by the Islamic world from the West. We'll talk about that a little bit tomorrow, okay? The Golden Age, Baghdad had a place called the House of Wisdom. It was like a university and library and training center. They were gathering knowledge from all over the world and translating it into Arabic. The Greek philosophers, Aristotle, Plato, and all the rest were completely lost to the West until we ended up getting Arabic translations of them after the fall of the, uh, the Sult Sultanate of Cordoba in the Iberian Peninsula. So we have to thank the Islamic um, Caliphate of the Abbasids for doing that for us. Now all of these Caliphates were Sunni, other than the short time that Ali was himself one of the Rashidun Caliphates. The, the Sunni, and I'll explain Sunni and, and Shia in a minute, um, it has always been dominant. It constitutes 85% today, but while the Abbasid Caliphate was in existence, and this is the greatest extent that they had, around 850, you'll notice by this time they had lost the possessions that they had up in um, up in the Iberian Peninsula. But at the same time, they started, while they were focusing on all this knowledge and culture and wisdom and invention and science and medicine, they began to lose some of their peripheral territories to others. And during that time, another caliphate comes along, which is the Fatimid Caliphate. This is the this is uh, descended from Fatima, the wife of Ali, the, the daughter of Muhammad. Now this is the only time in the history, other than Ali himself for a few years, the only time that the Shia uh, line of Islam has had any authority. Um, Fatima, oh, here, the daughter of Muhammad married to Ali. Now. This was a subset. They were during the same years and inside the Abbasid Caliphate. Under the Fatimid Caliphate, they again went further to what's called the Maghreb into uh, West Africa, all of Egypt and down into Sudan, and the, the Hejaz, you'll notice Mecca, Medina, and all of the uh, area of what we know as the Levant. You will notice that they were not up in Turkey, as we know it, or further to the west, Afghanistan, places that were Islamic, but they didn't control. The reason for that is because the next group that comes along, the Ayyubid dynasty, you'll notice it's not called the Caliphate, because this was founded by a Kurdish general whose name you may have heard, Saladin. Saladin had been the vizier, sort of the, the the chief minister of Egypt under the Fatimids, and he finally got tired of them and took it over. And so he created the Ayyubid dynasty, but he did not claim to be the religious authority. The caliphs were not just the political leaders, they were the religious authorities, the religious leaders. He didn't make that claim. Uh, uh, Saladin became very famous for his work uh, in fighting against the Crusaders. The famous battles between Richard the Lionheart from England and Saladin, they came to really respect each other and showed respect even while they were fighting each other. So the Ayyubid dynasty was founded by Saladin. He technically actually reabsorbed the Fatimid dynasty back into the Abbasids, but it was it's, uh, the Abbasid Caliphate, but it was a particular dynasty. This is what it looked like under Saladin. He took over all of what had been the Fatimid, but again, you'll notice up here, these are Islamic territories, but did not fall under the Ayyubid dynasty. The reason for that is a group called the Turks. From Turkmenistan, one of the stands, as we used to call it when I worked at World Vision, you know, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, all the stands, those little countries over there. When the, some of the Islamics were fighting against the, the Byzantines, they asked for mercenaries to come and help them from Turkmenistan. They were great warriors. They came and they helped fight the battle against the Byzantines, but finally they got tired because they were the strong ones, and they took over. They were the Seljuk Turks. And they created their own empire, 
which was called the Ottoman Empire. This is the start of the Ottoman Empire, which was in the, the 1400s, the 15th century. And eventually, the Ottoman Empire grew to its height, its largest uh, scale, under Suleiman the Magnificent. Have you, any of you all been to Istanbul? Have you been to the Mosque of Suleiman? It is, it's not on, many of the tours don't get up to the top to the Mosque of Suleiman, but it is spectacular. He was called Suleiman the Magnificent. He was a terrific administrator, governor, and the Ottoman Empire really was established under him. Now you will notice something. This is Turkey. This is what we know of as Greece. Do you see how far he went? All the way up into Hungary. Eventually, the Ottoman Empire, for a very long time, was right at the gates of Vienna. All of Eastern Europe, all of the Balkans, as well as all of Turkey, and eventually, of course, they took over North Africa, uh, Egypt, Arab the Hejaz part of Arabia, all the way down to the Horn of Africa. This was the Ottoman Empire, and for six centuries, the Ottoman Empire was the link between the East and Western world. And again, at their height, they were the center of culture and refinement and education, an extraordinary dynasty. Now, this, um, they actually have this map on the slideshow up in the Yacht Club. Um, at their height, as I said, they were all the way up here in uh, Hungary. They actually reached into Vienna, all of North Africa. But starting in the 1600s, the European powers got together and started pushing the Islamic Turks out. Uh, there was a group called the Holy League, which was a number of European countries that got together. The Holy League drove first out of Central Europe and then later on the countries of Bulgaria, of Serbia and others defeated the, the Turkish armies and pushed them back out. I talked about that when I was talking about Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. Um, this is the point at which the Ottoman Empire became known as the sick old man of Europe. Of course, in the Second World War, they sided with the wrong team. They ended up losing in the uh, First World War, excuse me, they ended up losing the First World War. And after 1918, the Ottoman Empire ended. And shortly thereafter, because they were talking about splitting up Turkey, Ataturk, um, the Mustafa uh, Kemal Ataturk, threatened to fight another war over it. They finally backed off, and he created the Republic of Turkey, westernized it. The last sultan left, and the last sultanate, or I'm sorry, the last caliphate of Islam ended in 1924. There have been no caliphs, no religious successors to Muslim, to, uh, to Muhammad since then, until this past summer when Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the head of ISIL, declared himself the caliph and said all Muslims were responsible to him. And, and as I said this morning, and everybody said, yeah, not likely. Um, nobody has accepted him. Now let's talk about the, some of the divisions that occurred. I know that's a lot of history, but then when you read other things, you can sort of understand the various phases they've gone through as caliphates. This is what Islam looks like. And if you think it's simple, then trust me, it's not. If you, people look at Christianity and they say, well, there's Roman Catholic, there's Eastern Orthodox, there's Oriental Orthodox, there's Protestant. Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists, boy, it's mixed up. That's nothing compared to the way Islam is. Because you've got the two main schools, or two main uh, factions, which are Sunni. 85% of all Muslims are part of the Sunni side of things. The Sunnis um, follow what they, the Sunnah means the well-trodden path, or the tradition, the way of Muhammad. But they are much, for the most part, they are much more relaxed about it because, for instance, they don't believe, they believe imams, their religious leaders, are human. They're fallible. They're not perfect. And that you elect the best ones you can, but that there's no divine intervention. The Shia believe that their imams are divinely appointed and infallible. You know, you get characters like the Ayatollah Khomeini, who was, who was Shia, because Iran is almost entirely Shia. Um, he was considered infallible, and so whatever he said went, and that is still true under, under Shia today. Within Sunni, there are four major theological schools that are predominant in different regions of the world. The Hanafi, Hanbali, Maliki, and Shafi'i. The most conservative of those is the Hanbali, which is um, the, the school that is dominant in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is the most conservative Islamic country in the world in terms of a whole school. Now, we don't we don't think about that because they're an ally of ours, and the ruling family, the Sauds, 
are very advanced. But Wahhabism, which is the Hanbali interpretation of Islam in Saudi Arabia, is the most conservative, and in most people's idea would be the most oppressive. Women are not allowed to drive, women can't be seen in public without a male relative, etc., etc. Okay, we don't know a lot about it because not a lot of people travel in Saudi Arabia, but and they have good relations with the West. On the Shia side, however, you have a, a crazy mixed bag of things. In fact, this is just the Shia part of it. <laughs> this is Muhammad. Now, I'm gonna try to explain this in 50 words or less. <laughs> After Muhammad, there was a series of Imams, which are the religious leaders. They, and what group you belong to within Shia depends upon where you think the legitimate line of Imams ended. From Muhammad, Fatima, his daughter, two sons, Hassan and Hussein. At that point, there are some who believe Hussein was the last legitimate one, and he, there was one successor to him, and they come straight down and say, he's the one we look to as the legitimate last Imam. Then the three biggest groups are right here. Some people believe that there were five legitimate Imams, Zaid being the last one, and so they're called, often called fivers because they had five Imams, or Zaidis. Some people believe that it came down and that there were 12 Imams, the last one being Muhammad al-Mahdi. This is actually the biggest party within Shia. Muhammad al-Mahdi, Mahdi roughly translated means Messiah. Um, those are called Twelvers, because there were 12 Imams. Interestingly, they believe the 12th Imam, Muhammad al-Mahdi, disappeared from human sight in the 800s, but is still here and is coming back. He is considered the last Imam, and he went into a, a thing called occultation, which means he disappeared from sight, but he will return. And in the Shia Islamic belief, Jesus will come back to announce the return of the 12th Imam, the Mahdi. Jesus will be sort of the John the Baptist to the last Imam. And when the last Imam comes, then the world will end. There will be the day of judgment. But they believe he's still around. He didn't really go away. He's just, we just don't, can't see him. There's a group that believes that after um, Ishmael, uh, Ishmael, that the seventh Imam, Ishmael, they're called Ishmaelites, that there are, they're sometimes called the Southerners because they believe there were seven legitimate Imams. You get the Druze, who believe that there, there were a lot more than that, that Al-Hakim, the last Imam they recognized, was actually God incarnate. And that is so much against Islamic theology elsewhere that the, a lot of people don't believe the Druze are actually Muslims. You then have the Naziris. The Naziris believe there have been 49 different generations of Imams, and there's one alive today. He's a billionaire who lives in England, raises racehorses, and owns race cars, and they believe that he is their infallible guy, and he's a businessman, okay? Very, a billionaire. Fascinating stuff. And you get all these other bits and pieces of things. Now, if you ever thought that Islam was one thing, and that they were all working on this together, in fact, the Shia believe that the Sunnis have oppressed them all the way back to the time of Hussein, because after all that fighting with Ali, you know, and, and and the Uyamids um, um, took over. Hussein tried to fight back, and his followers promised to support him, and when Hussein went to fight the battle, they all deserted him. And to this day, the Shiites celebrate at, with, by beating themselves over the fact that the followers of Hussein betrayed him, and he was killed as a result of that. And that's still seen as a disastrous time for them. So there's all of this different understanding. The Shiites, which is the, the, the name for the people who follow Shia, and the Sunnis have fought wars over this for ever since the time of Ali. Um, we had an almost decade-long war between Iran, which is almost entirely Shia, and between Iraq, which is predominantly Sunni. Almost 10 years they were fighting a horrible, nasty war, primarily because of their religious differences. There were, there were political issues as well. but. Um, this continues to be, I mean, it would be like the Presbyterians and the Methodists going to war against each other, you know? We can't imagine this kind of difference. This is the way the map looks right now. All of the green, which is obviously predominant, is Sunni. And there are various theological schools in that you can break down. 
The orange part, which is primarily Iran and then other pieces, part of Yemen, etc., is uh, Shiite. You have here the purple um, in Oman is Ibadi, which is sort of a descent from the Karahites, which were another party that came along, but they're very different as well. They have a different approach to things. So um, don't ever let anybody tell you that oh, all those Muslims are all the same and they're all coming to get us. They're, they're fighting each other more than they're anybody else, okay? Basic beliefs of Islam. We touched on this earlier. Islam is more about orthopraxy, which means right action, than it is about orthodoxy, right belief. Now, if you don't have the right beliefs, you're not gonna have the right action, but they are very, very directed toward actions. That's why when you talk about Islam, you talk about the five pillars of Islam, which are five actions that people are called on to do. I'm gonna give you some beliefs here in a second. All of their orthopraxy, their right action, is based upon um, the writings of the Quran, which is seen as a divine book. I'm going to mention a little bit more. The Sunnah, which is the life example of Muhammad, and the Hadith, which are commentaries uh, regarding the sayings of Muhammad and his companions. One thing to recognize is that the revelation to Muhammad was given in Arabic, his language. Islam believes that Arabic is the language of God. And so Arabic is the true language. You, Whenever the Quran is translated into another language, it's not considered the true Quran. It's considered a commentary on the Quran because you have to learn Arabic. For instance, the Declaration of Faith, the Shahada we'll talk about, is only to be done in Arabic. So there's a huge deal. That's why all of the countries that have become Islamic, they were just in Egypt. What language did they speak? Arabic. Now they had Coptic Egyptian uh, before that, but all of these countries speak Arabic as their dominant language. The word Islam means submission. It is submission to Allah, and ultimately, like in the Shiite side of it, it means submission to the servants of Allah, which are the Imams, the Ayatollahs, etc. A Muslim, that word is from the same root, it means one who submits to Allah. Now, the three main sources for them, the Quran, which means recitation in Arabic, it is the sacred text, the highest authority in all things. It is believed to be the very words of God. In fact, it's seen as being the word of God incarnate, literally a manifestation of God's own word. Cannot be edited, cannot be changed, cannot be questioned. It was given in Arabic. It must be read in Arabic. It's thought to be flawless. It's thought to have existed for all eternity, and God simply gave it to humanity through Muhammad. It's divided into 114 chapters, which are called surahs. Those are broken up into verses, very much like what we're, we're used to if the uh, Hebrew Bible or the Christian Bible. The verses are called ayat, which means signs. The length of the Quran is about the same as the New Testament. It's about the same length as the Christian New Testament. Um, while it can be read, because the na very name of it means to recite, it's believed that the best way, the proper way, to hear the Quran is to hear it recited. And in fact, people who do a recitation, professional reciters of the Quran, called Qura, are highly respected. It's one of the most advanced positions you can have in the Islamic culture, is to be one who can professionally recite the Quran. People who can memorize all of the Quran, which is commonly done, are especially honored in this culture, and there, there's a special name for them. Now, interestingly, the Quran is, the, the surahs or chapters of the Quran are in, um, not in chronological order as they were written. They're pretty much, except for the first chapter, they're pretty much by length. The longest ones come first, the shorter ones come later. Because the shortest ones were written early during the struggle in Mecca and early Medina, um, the, it's almost in reverse chronological order. And if that sounds funny to you that they're not in chronological order, well, neither is the Christian New Testament. The books of uh, Paul, starts with the books of Romans, for instance, and it's more than half of the New Testament, it's because Romans is the longest one. It's not the first one he wrote. Uh, Galatians was probably the first one he, wrote, one he wrote. So we did the same thing. So the Quran is the holy book. The Sunnah is the clear, well-trodden path, is the translation in Arabic. It means the ideal way of life, the path for Muslims. It's based upon the teaching and the practices of Muhammad. How did he live his life? Because a verse in the third surah of the Quran says, obey God and his messenger. So the example of Muhammad is critical to how a, um, is, a Muslim is supposed to live their lives. 
the sunnah is uh, interpreted through the hadith that we'll talk about in a minute, but it reflects Muhammad's specific words, habits, practices, and approvals. It deals with all manner of life, not just religion, but with how you deal with friends, family, government, marriage relationships, all manner of things. Now, the sunnah is expressed in the third category, which is the hadith. Hadith means narrative or report. And here's where we get such a radical difference in different Islamic groups. Because the hadith, the report of what Muhammad said, how he reflected on the Quran, which part of that do you want to emphasize? The very radical sides of Islam will take a much more aggressive or radical interpretation of certain parts of the hadith, the commentaries on the Quran and on Muhammad's life, those that are more concerned about you know, a, a gen, more gentle approach to Islam will, will focus on others. There are six major hadith or collections of interpretations of, Mora, of the Quran and of Muhammad's view on things in, in the Sunni side. There are four more on the, um, the Shiite side. And depending upon which one of these you want to emphasize, you're going to get a very different interpretation of the words of the Quran and what Muhammad intended. Now, the Hadith is more the source of Sharia, that is Islamic law, than is the Quran itself, because it's seen as the commentary on that. And that's why you can get, um, one of our tour guides on this trip mentioned the fact that, you know, why is it that some Islamic women cover themselves completely with burqas, you know, even their eyes are not fully visible, and some dress like Westerners, except they cover their arms and, and legs. Well, it's because in the Quran, all it says is a woman should be covered, meaning a woman should be modest. Well, what does that mean? Different versions of the Hadith say that means you can't see her at all, that seeing her hands is the most that's allowable, and others say that just simply means she should be modest. And so you get very different interpretations, and those are reflected in the Hadith. There are six articles of faith in Islam. The first one is belief in one God. This is called a Tawid. Tawid is, is a version of, the, of number one in Arabic. Tawid means you believe in one God, nothing else can be seen as competing with God or attached to God or related to God. God is solitary. Anytime that you do anything that suggests that there is something more that's equal to God or attached to God, that's the, the worst sin you can commit. It's called shirk in Islam. And it is the one sin that is considered unforgivable. Secondly, Muslims believe in the angels of God. Now angels in Islam are not the same as angels in the Christian faith, for instance. Angels are seen as being produced from light. They do not have free will. They are the messengers and servants of God. They, entire, they work tirelessly to do God's will, but they, there's no such thing as a fallen angel. There's another spiritual being called a jinn, which you may have heard of. That's where we get the term genie, but they don't live in bottles, and they don't wear little harem outfits, you know, like a dream of genie. <laughs> the jinn are spiritual beings that are made from fire, and they do have free will, and some of them are evil. They're the ones that tempt people. In fact, shaitan um, is, or Satan is the word we use, is considered to be a jinn who wishes to lead people to do evil. But this belief in angels and jinns of God, belief in the prophets and messengers of God, especially Muhammad, um, the Islamic faith believes that all of the Jewish prophets and ma major figures in the Old Testament are prophets of God. That in fact, God has sent prophets to instruct human beings through all history. Many of them we don't know of, but we do know the ones that are captured in the Hebrew Bible and in the Christian New Testament. So Adam, and they're all men, Adam and Noah and Abraham and Moses and David, and all of them are considered prophets of God. But the major prophet is Muhammad, because when Muhammad gave, came, God gave him his perfect word, the Quran, and that's the seal of prophets, that no more prophets are needed. And that's the final one, the unchangeable one, according to Islam. Messengers are special kinds of prophets that are given a specific message to communicate. Particularly, uh, Abraham was given the scrolls of Abraham, which now have been lost, but they were believed to be a message to humanity. David was given the Psalms, the Zabur. Moses was given the Torah. Jesus was given the Injil, or Gospels. Muhammad was given the Quran. Those are the messengers. They're a more advanced category of prophet. 
There is a belief in the books of God, especially the Quran. When I say the books of God, that includes the scrolls of Abraham, the Psalms of David, the Torah of Moses, the Gospels of, to Jesus, and ultimately the Quran. Islam values all those other writings, especially the Jewish Torah and the Christian Gospels, but they believe that human beings distorted those books. The reason why, down through Muslim history, there has generally been an acceptance, at least at least a tolerance, of Jews and Christians amongst Muslims, there has been far more persecution of Muslims and Jews by Christians than there have been the other way around, folks. That's just a historical fact. Um, whatever we see today in these small militant groups, historically the Muslims have been more tolerant of us than we have been of them. So the idea is that the Gospels given to Jesus and the Torah given to Moses, uh, to, uh, through Moses are books of God, but we've messed them up and the Quran was intended to straighten them out. That's the belief of Islam. That's not my own belief, but that's what the belief of Islam is, okay? But they value all those books, and in fact, all both Jews and Christians are called people of the book because we do have holy writings, even if we've messed them up. We have, they have a belief in the day of judgment and an afterlife that ultimately when the Mahdi, the Messiah comes back, Jesus will come back as his, uh, as his, to prepare the way, that the Mahdi will declare the end of all time there will be a judgment and those who have lived a good life according to Muslim uh, rules will be get sent into paradise, those who haven't will be sent to hell. Non-Muslims, those who have not followed Allah will always spend their life, their eternity in hell. Muslims will eventually get out and get to go to paradise. There is a belief in the supremacy of God's will and his divine decree. This means basically um, the idea of preordination. Everything is in God's will. Uh, um, inshallah, as God wills it. One of our guys actually said that a number of times. Well, we're going to be there, inshallah, if God wills it. That God has control of everything. I mentioned already the messengers and the prophets. There are a number, a lot of prophets from the Old Testament, New Testament that Islam accepts as prophets. The five pillars of Islam. The first one is the Shahada, which is the declaration of faith. And again, one of the problems in studying this, one of the things that makes it complicated, is that there's no one way to translate or transliterate Arabic into an English language or any other language. So you'll see, see this spelled in many different ways. The inshallah in English is, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. Um, it's la ilaha illa Allah wa Muhammad rasul Allah in Arabic. That declaration is the first thing that a baby is supposed to hear upon being born. It is the last thing that a Muslim is supposed to say before their death. That this declaration in the presence, per, pronounced correctly in Arabic, in the presence of two Muslims, with belief in all of Islam, is all that's required to be a Muslim. You don't have to be baptized, you don't have to go through classes or anything else. That's all that's required. It does represent an acceptance of all that Muslims uh, stand, uh, Islam stands for. The second that you have all heard the call to is prayer, the Salah. Five times a day, at least, there is a call to pray. It happens at dawn, midday, afternoon, sunset, and evening. It is preceded by uh, ablutions, washing, and if you can't, the interesting thing about Islam is there are exceptions to everything in certain circumstances. If you don't have any water, which is the case often in the desert, you can wash with sand to prepare yourself to pray. Um, if you're called upon to give and you don't have any money, then you don't have to give as much or you can wait. If, you, if you're in a situation you can't pray at a given time, you can pray twice later or when the circumstance allows it. Somebody asked us when we were on our, our Falukas and so we're sailing in the Nile, well, if these guys are Islamic, we hear the call of prayer, why aren't they praying? Well, they're working. Later, they'll make up for it, all right? The third is generous almsgiving, or zakat. Two and a half percent of your uh, earthly wealth is supposed to be given annually. In Shia Islam, you're supposed to give another fifth of your wealth for the hidden imam and his servants. So there are differences. Now this money is supposed to go to people who have need. It's not just to go to the mosque. It goes to people who have need. It can, it's to be confidential. But if you, know, if you have a family member, somebody you're close to that you know has need, you can fulfill this by giving them money as long as you don't broadcast it. Um, and those people who don't have money are allowed to, not, to reduce the amount or not give. There is an exception to that. There's an additional a sadaqa, which is a voluntary giving to people in special need. Um, this has always been the case, and this is why when Muslim armies conquered other places, they, made, they didn't force them, in very few cases they didn't, uh, they didn't force them to convert, 
but they did require that they pay the tax because all the Muslims were expected to pay the tax. The fourth is fasting. Whoop, whoop. I don't know why they did that. Fasting or psalm, which is done during the holy month of um, Ramadan. It's not only fasting from food and water during the daytime from daylight to sunset, but it's also fasting from sexual relations during those hours. It's a time of prayer, of meditation, of holiness. It ends with one of the biggest celebrations in Islam, which is the Eid al-Fidir, which is the, the festival of the breaking of the fast. Um, and it is a time of holiness. That's the whole point of it. This, I'm having trouble with this thing, sorry. And lastly, the pilgrimage to Mecca. The pilgrimage to Mecca, or the Hajj, is to be taken once in your life. When you go to Mecca, you participate with, with uh, these days it's over two million people every year. Um, the Hajj is the largest gathering of human beings on the planet every year. And two million or more people will go to Mecca. If you are ill or can't afford it, if you can't support your family while you're making the trip, then you don't have to go. But it is considered a great honor. In fact, someone who completes the Hajj can add Hajj or Haji to their name their, the, to reflect the fact that they have fulfilled this obligation in their life. Now, I will mention that amongst the Ismaili or Southerner branch of Shia, there are two more of these principles. One of them is Walaja, which is the guardianship of the faith, and the other is Tahara, which is purity or cleanliness. So some add to this. This is what it looks like at the main mosque in Mecca during the Hajj. Again, two million people. Um, the building that is there in the center is the Kaaba, which is believed to have been around in some, some versions of it since Adam, and other versions since Abraham. It is a, it's a building. You know, you can go inside it, although the door's not often open, and they have to bring stairs to get up there. They go in to clean it and everything. But this is the, the little temple building that supposedly uh, first Abraham and Ishmael and later Muhammad uh, drove, went in and cleaned out all of the false idols. This is another view of that. There is the, the black and gold on it is a, an embroidered cloth, which they renew regularly you know, before the, um, the uh, event. Now, what happens here with all of these people is first the people who arrive, when you get there to the Hajj, uh, before you get into Mecca, you are given, you go through ritual washing, the men are given two long strips of white cloth which they wrap around themselves, and part of the focus there is not only purity, but also the fact that everybody is the same. There is no difference in terms of wealth or status. Everyone looks the same, everyone is equal before God. When you get to the main temple area and this black box represents the Kaaba, you walk counterclockwise around the Kaaba seven times. Embedded in a corner of the, of the Kaaba is a black stone, which is a meteorite, which was it said that God sent that stone, and I've heard two different versions of it, either to Adam or to Abraham. And so, ideally, you know, many, many years ago, people would go up and kiss it or touch it. Now, when you've got two million people there, not that many people can get that close, so you at least point at it as you go around. Um, then, after that, you will proceed. There are two hills, Safa, and Marwa. The story of Hagar and her son Ishmael, when they left out from the household of, of Abraham and went into the desert and thought they were going to die, Hagar sets Ishmael down and she's running around looking for water. The people will travel back and forth between Safa and Marwa, these two hills, as a symbol of Hagar's search for water. They will then drink from the well of Zamzam, which you see there. They then, after this, will go out and spend time standing vigil on the plains, spend the night on the plains, and then they will perform a symbolic stoning of Satan by throwing rocks at these three pillars. Now, this is all undercover now. This is all under this big, beautiful building. I've not been there because I'm not Islamic, and you're not allowed there if you're not Muslim. Um, but it's all undercover, and, the, and they have lanes that go in the two directions, and in the middle there's a, there's a, a, a lane for people with limited mobility. So that people who have disabilities, crutches, canes, walkers, can, can go back and forth without people jostling them. So this is part of what happens during the, um, the Hajj every year. Now, one last thing I want to mention to you, because the people ask questions. The rise of political Islam, the thing that you hear all about. 
Islamism or political Islam is the belief that Islam is not only a religious faith, but it should also be the political order. It should drive our politics. It should drive everything else about our life. Um, it really originated as a, there's always been an aspect of this, but it really originated as a movement in 1928 as part of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which you have heard of fairly recently because they had a candidate elected the president and then ousted and all sorts of things. The Muslim Brotherhood, for the most part, they have been peaceful. There have been some fairly radical things they've done, but for the most part peaceful. But there are other parts of Islamism, other segments of it, sections or sects of it, that have been quite radical, and they have advocated militant overthrow of other governments and that sort of thing. But Islamism is the term you want to use if you're talking about those that are aggressive and political. Not all Islamists are that way, but that is one term. Now, there is a movement called the Salafi movement. Salaf uh, refers to the ancestors or predecessors, those who were the first generation of Muhammad. Muhammad is uh, quoted in the Hadith as saying, the people of my own generation are the best, then those who come after them, and then those of the next generation. So this is an effort to get back and live and act the way the earliest generations of Islam, which means it's a return to a very fundamentalist kind of approach. It is all Sunni. It rejects the Shia Islam outright. So 15% of the people are assumed to be wrong right out of the bat. It emphasizes Sharia, which is the Islamic law based upon the Hadith, the Quran in, as well, but especially as, as in the Hadith. This is especially present in Saudi Arabia, in the United Arab Emirates. We're going to be in Dubai, which is sort of a, I think, a liberal you know, uh, oasis in the middle of a very conservative Islamic country. And the Qatar, another of the countries there. Um, there is a movement within Salafism called Salafi Jihadism. The word Jihad does not mean war. It means struggle. It means, you know, uh, an effort to overcome. It has been interpreted uh, as sometimes being militaristic. But the Salafi Jihadism is a movement toward that. Wahhabism is another term that you should know. Wahhabism is an ultra-conservative uh, version of fundamentalism that is the dominant sort of theological, Sunni theological approach in Saudi Arabia. It's not, when I say dominant, it's the largest, it's not, does it, not the majority. It comes from a very conservative interpretation of Islam from the 1700s by um, a preacher and scholar named Muhammad Ibn Abd al-Wahhab. The family Saud, uh, Abdulaziz Ibn Saud, who took over all of Saudi Arabia, defeated you know King Hussein that we talked about, drove him out, created Saudi Arabia, he and his family had joined together with the very ultra-conservative movement of Wahhabism. And so that's always underneath what's going on in Saudi Arabia. That's why it is the, one of the strictest of all the Islamic countries in its interpretation. A cap is kept on it by the royal family of uh, Saud because they are very westernized, they are very wealthy, they don't want anybody to rock the ship, and so they kept a lid on it. But Wahhabism helped them in their efforts to take over that country and control it. Wahhabism is also the theological foundation behind ISIL, or ISIS, or the Islamic State. ISIL is probably the best interpretation. The name of the organization literally means the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, not Syria. You know, ISIS is when they put Syria in there. Levant means more than that. So ISIL is better. They now call themselves just the Islamic State. Nobody wants to call them that because that makes it sound like they're the only one, and they're not. Um, they originally were part of Al-Qaeda, and they, were, they got so radical even Al-Qaeda wouldn't put up with them. And so there was a split there. They have been very successful in taking over large areas of um, Iraq and Syria. There continue to be battles there. Um, in June of this year, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, as I said, declared himself the Caliph, which means the religious leader of all of Islam, and nobody buys it but that's the way they're thinking. A number of commentators have said their ultimate goal may be to try to conquer all of the Levant and come down and try to take over Saudi Arabia. Now, whether they have the ability to do that or not is a serious in question. But the reasons for believing that is because Saudi Arabia has the holy sites of Islam in Mecca and Medina. It is the dominant theological view or the largest theological view of Islam in Saudi Arabia is Wahhabism, which is consistent with the, found, the theological foundation of ISIL and because there's that much more wealth in the oil. So again, nobody is in support of them. Nobody likes them. All the relig religious leaders of Islam have condemned them. Even Al-Qaeda has condemned them. 
They have been declared a terrorist nation by the United Nations, U.S., Canada, everybody else. The Grand Mufti of Egypt and of Sudan have all declared them to be, um, to be heretics from Islam. Um, this is what the map looked like as of October in terms of the area controlled by ISIL here. Uh, this is Iraq. This is Syria. Um, there are other Syrian rebels controlling areas here. Um, well, you can sort of see. There's a, it's, it's a mess right now. I've had people say to me, well, why don't the people there fight back against all this? Well, they are. Um, they're fighting battles every single day. One of the problems was the United States provided military weapons to the Army of Iraq, and the Army of Iraq did not do a very good job, and so a lot of the weapons the United States have provided are now in the hands of these of, of ISIL, and they're using them effectively. The U.S. has now committed ground troops. Others are prepared to deal with it. It's not an easy thing to do. And let's face it, most of the countries that are closer by they don't have the military capabilities that a lot of Western countries do, and so for them to commit themselves is a very serious thing. Okay, I've gone way too long. I apologize for that. Thank you for listening. Are there questions? Yes? Uh, what was the historical and cultural context in the 30 years following Muhammad's death that allowed it to expand so rapidly and so broadly? You could, um, the question was, how is it that Islam expanded so rapidly and so broadly after Muhammad's death? What was the situation? Well, um, you can probably first look to Abu Bakr, the first successor, the first caliph after, after Muhammad. He felt so much that Muhammad's message was right and should be spread that he started a war of conquest. Now again, it's important to know, he was not conquering the, the, the ordinary people, he was conquering the governments. And then they were dealing quite you know, generously in most cases with the people. But first Abu Bakr, then Umar, and then Uthman, those three, first three of the, the Rashidun Caliphs were very aggressive in saying we need to spread the message of, of Muhammad and if we have to do so by conquering these lands then we will do that. Um, Muhammad himself was involved in you know, helping conquer theologically um, especially all, most of the, the Saudi Peninsula. So they believed they were right, that God had given them this message and they needed to share it, and if that meant they had to conquer the governments in those areas, the, the armies in those areas, in order to share it with the people, then they were going to do that. How did the people accept it so rapidly? Well, um, there were a lot of reasons. Once, once the, and, and it's a good question, because North Africa, for instance, was all Christian, and now it's almost entirely Muslim. There was the issue of having to pay a special tax beyond what the Muslims had to pay, the idea that you were not among the favored party, there was a lot of social pressure, you know, and over time there was simply a growth of the Muslim presence there because the government supported it and encouraged it. It's also true that as Islam began to be so, the golden age of Islam began to be so attractive, again, we look at this and we say, why would anybody want to do that? Well, there was a period of about 500 years there between the 9th century, well, at least 300 years between the 9th century and the 12th century, when Islam was the going thing. They had education, they had science, they had culture, and, and people would have been attracted to it. And I think they were. And so we saw massive conversions, not because they were forced to. In a very few cases they were, but in most cases it was voluntary. Um, and they did convert. Other questions? Yes? Can't hear you, sorry. That's true. It is true. Now, modern Islamism really begins in 1928 with the Muslim Brotherhood in terms of an organized movement. It is true that from the time of Abu Bakr, in fact, from the time of Muhammad, there was a, an aggressiveness where they sought to spread their faith and, and the political and the religious was connected, which again is a concept that's foreign to us, but is consistent. You know, the theocratic kind of approach is consistent with Islam and has been with other religions as well. Um, the difference is, in the modern Islamists, especially the, the, like the Salafi Jihadists, is that, again, in most times in history, while they were aggressive in conquering other governments and other armies, their treatment of the ordinary people was pretty much, you can follow the faith that you want to follow. Ultimately, that many of them were converted, but much of it was because Islam started looking really good, I think. Now, the difference in modern times is there's been a much more aggressive effort 
to force themselves on others, and if they don't go along, to massacre villages and things like that. That was not the typical approach through most of the history of Islam. And again, I'm not Muslim. I'm not defending this because you know I'm coming from a party view. Um, the historical fact is that for most of the history, Islam, while they conquered the other governments and the other armies, the people were allowed to proceed as they as they wanted, other than having a governor who was Islamic and a and paying a tax. Uh, it is a, it's a fairly recent phenomenon that there is that kind of aggressive effort to try to force Islam on people, and, and that. That's why even Muslims around the world find that so abhorrent, because that's not been the history. That's not consistent with the way most people interpret the Quran or Muhammad's intentions. Okay? And again, I'm just trying to be fair. I think we need to we need to have a fairness and a knowledge of where this stuff is coming from before we, you know, have strong opinions about it. I you know, I obviously am not in support of any of that stuff. I'm not Islamic, I'm Christian. But I do feel an obligation to know as much about it as I can before I make declarations about it. Okay? And I hear a lot of people, not not on this boat, but I hear people saying things to me that clearly reflect a complete lack of understanding of what Islam is about. Um, and if, if we're going to be critical of it, we at least need to know what it is we're criticizing, I think. Other questions? Yes? Uh, yesterday you talked about World War One and how the, uh, they're very accepting of Israel. Can you explain how they kind of changed? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> because tomorrow I'm going to be talking about culture and conflict and why is it that, you know, um, King Hussein uh, of the Hajaz and Faisal, his son, who at that point was king of Iraq, both spoke very positively about welcoming Jews and creating one country together. So what went wrong? Um, and so we'll talk about that more tomorrow. And tomorrow is going to be more my own reflection of my, my perspective on it. And I'll encourage your, you know, your comments on that as well. Uh, less of a strictly historical point of view, which is what I'm trying to do in most of the talks, and more here's what it looks like to me. Other questions? Well, thank you all very much. I do appreciate it.